approximate year in which the Messiah would arrive. And so at that time, they'd be looking for a sign. Now, it couldn't have been an extremely dramatic sign because it would have been recorded everywhere. And it couldn't be an extremely undramatic sign because it wouldn't alert their attention. And so in this paper, I described several astronomical events that could have aroused uh, their um, you know, motivation to go to Jerusalem. I personally don't think it was a conjunction of planets because none of the conjunctions that took place at that time would have been dramatic enough to warrant that kind of response. And I don't think it was a supernova because likewise that was too dramatic. So I think it was probably, some have suggested a comet, uh, but comets attracted a lot of attention back then too. My favorite uh, explanation is a recurring nova. Uh, you know, not as dramatic as a supernova, and the beauty of a recurring nova is that you can get one explosion and a second explosion a year or two later. And see, the text records that. The star appeared, disappeared, and reappeared a year and a half to two years later. And so a recurring nova would fit that theme. And in both cases, the text makes it clear that the star did not point the way to the baby Jesus. You know, some of the looser translations put it that way, but that's not in the uh, Greek text. It simply alerted the wise men that they were on the right track, you know. So it got their attention and kept them going. And hey, once you know it's Bethlehem, that's what the uh, Hebrew scholars told them in Jerusalem, that the prophet Micah said Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem's a tiny town. It wouldn't take you that long to find a pregnant woman who was about to give birth. And so once they knew it was Bethlehem, they were all set. And when they were on their way to Bethlehem, the star reappeared. And so that confirmed to them they were on the right track. But if you want more details, you can get the handout from us. Yes? When I had a footnote to Joshua's law, they worked an Indian tribe in South America, and they had the mythology of the story of the law of Moses, which I've always correlated with the law of Joshua. Yeah, there are a few historical accounts that speak about it. South America, that's quite common. So it's possible it's more than just that one valley. I was simply saying the text itself doesn't go beyond that single valley, but who knows? What did you say is the diameter of the universe or the breadth of the universe you just mentioned before? Well, I think it was George Lebo here that gave you the answer. <laughs> About a 15 million... 15 billion uh, radius. 15 billion light year radius. So the most distant objects we can see are about 14 billion light years away. Um, And what we notice is the farther away you look, the fewer and fewer galaxies and quasars you see. So what we're seeing is a fall off that takes us back to slightly after the moment of creation. Because the farther away you look, the closer you're getting to the creation event because you're looking back in time. And, of course, with the Big Bang Theory, if you look far enough away, there are no galaxies because you're looking so far back in time that the physics isn't right for galaxy formation yet. And so you'd expect a fall-off in the count of galaxies and quasars as you push towards the extremes. And, indeed, that's exactly what we see. In fact, there have been some astronomers that have measured that fall-off rate, and it's consistent with the Big Bang Theory. Is it actually possible with the technology to <clears throat> determine a place beyond which there is nothing or emptiness? Uh, well, it depends on your definition of nothingness. Uh, physicists have four different definitions of nothing. Uh, lack of matter is definition one. Lack of matter and energy is definition two. Lack of matter, energy, length, width, height, and time is definition number three. And there's what they call real nothing which means you don't have anything at all. And it's tough when you're listening to a physicist because he'll speak about creation out of nothing. But you have to ask him, well, which nothing are you talking about? (laughs) So uh, it is a little bit tricky. But yes, uh, we can, like say, when you're looking at the background radiation, uh, you're looking at material that's um, made just 300,000 years uh, after the creation event. And see, that's too early for stars and galaxies. So when you're witnessing the background radiation, you're looking so far away, so far back in time, that stars and galaxies have yet to form. 
Yes. I had two questions. One, one is more factual in nature. Like I had to, uh, for a class I was in one time, had to research the scientific validity of the Great Flood and found that if you drill a hole down at the South Pole, you'll find green ferns, quick frozen 100 feet below. And they've done expeditions up to Mount area and found the same kind of wood uh, described in the Old Testament of the Great Flood and so forth. And I was wondering if there's some recent stuff that's come out in the last five or 10 years about about the truth of the great flood. And the second question is more spiritual in nature. Is I, I kind of envision at some point you went through a metamorphosis spiritually, that you you were so preoccupied with your brain in terms of trying to figure out the whole validity of faith. Uh, and at one point it all of a sudden took you. The faith took over and and became more spiritual in nature. And I was just wondering if you would describe that event. Okay, two questions. One, can I talk about uh, scientific support for the Genesis Flood? And uh, two, can I describe uh, that moment in my life when it became more than just a head knowledge response to the evidence for God and more of a heart or emotional response? I'll deal with the second because I can hit it faster. And actually the first one I'll be talking about at this afternoon's seminar. Maybe we need to leave the first one after Okay, we could leave it for the afternoon seminar. Um, except to say that I'm extremely skeptical about many Christians' claims about evidence for the Genesis Flood. My personal interpretation of the Genesis Flood is that it was universal, but not global. The global flood theory became popular only in the 20th century. See, 100 years ago, universal didn't have to mean global, but today we're all global citizens, and we speak about universal, we immediately think of global. And see, if it's not a global flood, then we wouldn't expect a lot of geological evidence. In fact, in the region of Mesopotamia, there are six flood deposits, none of which would coincide with the Genesis flood because the Genesis flood wasn't the most dramatic of the floods that hit that region. I mean, we've had similar floods in California, in the San Joaquin Valley, where the water rose up four feet. Uh, four months later, it recited back out to the Pacific Ocean and left not one bit of geological evidence. So even a year-long flood with 22 and a half feet of water wouldn't necessarily leave a significant geological evidence. But uh, back to your second question. Uh, during that 18-month period, I came across Psalm 2, written by King David. And he speaks about the Son of God. And it says that we human beings are obligated to come to that Son of God first to be instructed that our minds would be instructed. Once our minds are instructed, our second response is, is to submit our will. And following the submission of our will, then and only then, will we gain a satisfying emotional relationship with our Creator. So the reason I focused on the mind, that's step one. And I ended with step two, the submission of your will. And it's through the submission of your will that you can come into a satisfying emotional relationship with your Creator. And I would argue, ultimately, that's the strongest evidence for the Christian faith, the fact that there's so many individuals here on planet Earth who have had their emotional response to life dramatically changed uh, by this encounter with Jesus Christ. But hey, that's when I ran out of time. So... Uh. I'm afraid we do need to keep to what we said, and that was finished at 12.35, it's actually 12.39 now. If your interest has been piqued in either the...